Okay, I think we'll get going with introductions. Nicole, can you hear me? We're, we're set to yes, go? We're all set. Okay. Okay. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to our monthly VCBH lecture series. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Mary Hooley. Mary Hooley is a primary care physician, implementation scientist, professor of medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics, and director of the Center for Healthcare Improvement and Medical Effectiveness at the San Francisco VA and the University of California, San Francisco. Her work focuses on applying health services research methods to accelerate the adoption of evidence practices, evidence-based practices within the VA's national healthcare system. She's a former Easterner in the sense that she went to medical school at Boston University and did her university at Yale. In terms of her research program, most recently she and her colleagues completed a PCORI funded study that demonstrated similar functional outcomes among patients undergoing virtual cardiac rehab compared to traditional facility-based cardiac rehab. This study also revolutionized delivery of cardiac rehabilitation services within the VA system and stands to extend cardiac rehab services in the standard medical care system to rural patients and patients who cannot, cannot otherwise attend. Dr. Hooley is also director of the Heart and Soul Study and site PI for the Million Veterans Program at the San Francisco VA. The Heart and Soul Study is a 20 year perspective cohort study of over a thousand older adults with ischemic heart disease and was originally designed to determine why depression is associated with adverse outcomes. Long story made short, she originally expected that it would be through biologic mechanisms like inflammation or elevated catecholamines but rather focuses attention on poor health behaviors, especially medication non-adherence and physical inactivity. And if anything is appropriate for the VCBH, that sure is. She's mentored numerous junior investigators and has, co has authored or co-authored more than 260 publications. I'm honored to consider Mary as a friend and I thank her for joining us today. The title of her talk is Heart and Soul and Cardiac Rehabilitation. Anything to add, Nicole, before we get going? Um, sure. Um, we just want to let everyone know that Dr. Hooley will present for about the next 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll do a quick um, break for Q&A, and we will have the chat function live. And if you could please put your questions for Dr. Hooley in the Q&A section as opposed to the chat, that would be helpful. Um, for anyone who may uh, want to revisit this, the lecture is being recorded and will be posted to our website uh, within the next week and CME available. So you can take a look for those through our Highmark system um, following this lecture. And if you have any questions, you can contact us through our website. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this kind invitation and for the honor of speaking to the VCBH community. Uh, I appreciate all of your attending on this historic inauguration day when, as we speak, uh, I think a new president is being sworn in. So let me uh, start by opening up my slides and clicking share. <clears throat> Zoom blocks my controls at the bottom of my screen, so I've tried to figure out how to here move this. There we go. All right. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak uh, with you today about heart and soul and cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, during the next 45 minutes, I will uh, describe the links between depression and adverse cardiovascular outcomes, discuss the key role of health behaviors, especially physical inactivity, and uh, talk about cardiac rehab as an underutilized opportunity to treat both 
mental health and uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, discuss ways to improve engagement in cardiac rehabilitation, which is uh, unfortunately undersubscribed and uh, discuss potential benefits of COVID, uh, a silver lining in car the cardiac rehab story. You may have seen this published in October. Uh, the Global Burden of Disease Study is a long ongoing study that every few years publishes the ranked order of disability causing conditions in the world. And they evaluate uh, 369 diseases and injuries in over 200 countries and then rank them. And this most recent analysis was between 1990 and 2019. Um, and in 2019, they uh, found that the 10 leading non-communicable causes of death and disability in adults included uh, depressive disorders as number seven. Ischemic heart disease, of course, is the first with 183 million disability adjusted life years lost worldwide. Um, and then stroke and COPD, road injuries and diabetes and low back pain Depressive disorders, as of 2019, will result in 46 million disability adjusted life years lost worldwide. And this is not just because of the burden of depression in uh, everyday life for the people who suffer from it, but also because of the links between depression and other medical conditions. Uh, this study in the European Heart Journal way back in 2006 was a meta-analysis of depression as an etiologic and prognostic factor in coronary heart disease and evaluated 146,000 participants who were in 54 observational studies to quantify the risk of cardiovascular disease uh, incident cardiovascular disease and recurrent cardiovascular events associated with depression. This is uh, the kind of bottom line forest plot for the etiological studies that looked at the effect of depression on the incidence of coronary heart disease. And this study, as you can see, found that um, the effect of depression was a 90% greater risk of incident coronary heart disease events. They also looked at uh, a forest plot of the effect of depression on prognosis after coronary heart disease. So this is among existing patients. What about subsequent cardiovascular events and death? And in this meta-analysis found that depression was associated with a 60% greater risk of recurrent cardiovascular events. We were interested in this association um, between depression and cardiovascular disease. And about 20 years ago, began a study called the Heart and Soul Study, where we uh, tried to enroll patients with cardiovascular disease and measure everything about their heart to demonstrate that depression was a risk factor for subsequent events independent of their baseline cardiac disease severity. Um, our goal was to determine why depression is associated with adverse cardiovascular events. And all patients underwent a baseline exam that included a psychiatric interview, a blood draw, exercise treadmill testing, stress echocardiography, 24-hour Holzer monitoring, and a 24-hour urine. Depressive symptoms were assessed using the nine-item patient health questionnaire, and patients also underwent a psychiatric interview. The patients were followed for five years, and of course, depression was predictive of subsequent cardiovascular events. 
uh, as mentioned, we were able to show that this was independent of baseline cardiac disease severity because we carefully uh, put every patient through a treadmill and a stress echo and 24-hour Holter to um, measure their baseline disease severity, and then uh, looked at the annual rate of recurrent cardiovascular events defined as myocardial infarction, coronary congestive heart failure, stroke, or death during this five-year follow-up, and found that the annual rate of events um, in the lowest depressive symptom category of PHQ less than four was about uh, 6%, but the rate, rate of events uh, annually went all the way up to 16% in those with the most severe depressive symptoms and uh, was 10% in patients with moderate depressive symptoms, 9% in those with uh, just over the threshold of 10 for, uh, may, for, be, for being consistent with major depressive disorder. So our question, of course, was, well, what, uh, what's explaining this association? Um, I would love to hear uh, everybody's idea of the top three mechanisms. Maybe, can I see the chat or how does that work? Would, would they need to be put in the Q&A? Let me just uh, stop sharing this for a second. Smoking. <laughs> yes. Any others? Q&A. Reduced initiation and maintenance of exercise. Absolutely. Inactivity. Any other um, thoughts on inflammation? Phil votes for physical inactivity and fitness. Social isolation, very important. Uh, poor diet control. Excellent. So we started to look at these potential mechanisms and first looked at the association between depression and inflammation and did find that depression was associated with elevated levels of interleukin-6, uh, C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, white blood cell count, CD40 ligand. And uh, so the person who said inflammation was right. And then uh, we looked at platelet activation, uh, which was another kind of hot topic at the time and found that depression was associated with platelet activation in patients with heart disease. We then looked at catecholamines and found that depressive symptoms were associated with 24-hour urine norepinephrine excretion in patients with coronary heart disease. And we also found that depression was associated with 24-hour urinary cortisol in medical outpatients with coronary heart disease. We then looked at uh, genetic factors and found that the uh, serotonin transporter polymorphism was associated with depression, perceived stress, and norepinephrine in patients with coronary heart disease. Um, and I didn't show the social isolation uh, paper, but 
that also, uh, as someone pointed out, was associated with uh, coronary heart disease. And we found that, uh, sorry, with depression, and we found that depressive symptoms were associated with you know, worse exercise capacity at baseline. So that needed to be adjusted for. And then found that depression was associated with heart rate variability. And all of these things had been shown uh, before. So we were just trying to make sure that uh, we covered all the potential mechanisms that might be out there. And then finally, um, we looked at uh, depression and medication adherence and of course found that depression and medication uh, medication adherence was low and with dr higgins we must uh, mention that uh, depressive symptoms were of course associated with smoking and so that was one of the factors that uh, increased the risk of cardiovascular events so we returned then to our annual rate of recurrent cardiovascular events and started to ask, well, what could be the explanation for this association? And we did find that uh, the excess risk of cardiovascular events associated with depression was uh, 50% when only adjusted for age. But then after adding all of the other factors, um, we were able to explain the association. And the things that mostly reduced the association were the ones that you all pointed out in the chats. So um, if inflammation, smoking, medication, non-adherence, and physical inactivity. And um, in, in my view, uh, I think some of these um, biological mechanisms like inflammation, maybe downstream, in fact, from physical inactivity. So it, that may have actually been over adjustment. In any event, uh, this was a graph of the survival in patients with depressive symptoms and patients without depressive symptoms. The cumulative risk of cardiovascular events was higher in those with depressive symptoms or not. But after adjusting for all of these potential confounders and mediators, uh, this association was eliminated. So uh, we concluded from the study that uh, major depressive disorder does lead to cardiovascular disease, but it's largely through behavioral factors. And in turn, these behavioral factors likely influence uh, catecholamines, inflammation, and platelet activation. And then, of course, cardiovascular disease results in symptom burden and emotional dis distress, which can further depressive symptoms, and the vicious cycle continues. Um, before I move on, I will uh, stop sharing and um, see if there are any questions or comments. All right, well, hearing none, I will move forward. Um, so now I uh, will be describing cardiac rehab as an underutilized opportunity to treat both uh, depression and coronary heart disease. Uh, I have to say that this is not a new topic. Uh, Dr. Ades has been working on this for 30 years. And as you can see here, uh, was part of a clinical practice guideline that was published in 1995, uh, looking at cardiac rehabilitation and also published uh, this review in the Medical Clinics of North America in 2000. And 
uh, review article in the New England Journal uh, in 2001, so 20 years ago. Um, and I, I published a, a similar review on depression in the New England Journal at this time. And I remember they literally would get you on the phone for all of the edits. You couldn't just edit on a PDF. There weren't PDFs back then, but they would put, put you on the phone and go through every single thing one by one and discuss it with you. Should we add a comma here or not? Should we change which to that or not? And it was quite the um, laborious process. So uh, in addition to his scientific contributions, Dr. Aides did that. Just moving forward uh, to 2016, we have a, a systematic review and meta-analysis that shows that cardiac rehab leads to a 26% reduction in 12-month mortality after MI or revascularization. This uh, meta-analysis evaluated 63 studies with 15,000 participants and found that the risk of coronary heart disease uh, the relative risk was uh, 0.74, meaning a 26% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. And the relative risk for hospital admissions was 0.82 with an 18% reduction in hospital admissions. What's less well known is that exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation also has marked benefits on anxiety and depression. This was a recent meta-analysis published in 2018. And in this study, they evaluated um, a number of randomized trials, which compared the effects of cardiac rehab on anxiety and depression. And they found um, that exercise-based cardiac rehab was associated with uh, strong reduction in anxiety and effect size of minus 2.59, which is very large, and, uh, and also strong but less um, kind of impressive reduction in depressive symptoms with an effect size of 0.61. So I thought this was uh, especially important because it shows the anxiety that a lot of our patients feel after they've had a cardiac event and how important it is for us to engage with them and provide the self-efficacy that they will need for healthy behavior change throughout the rest of their lives. Um, let's see. Another interesting uh, point is that PTSD and depression are actually associated with higher cardiac rehab participation. In this study of 86,000 veterans, uh, we compared the rates of cardiac rehab participation among patients without PTSD or depression, that was 66,000, with depression only, 11,000, with PTSD only, 4,000, and with both PTSD and depression, and found that uh, the rates of participation were lowest in those without either disorder, and so 6.8% to uh, 10.5% uh, between 2010 and 2014, and highest in those with both PTSD and depression, ranging up to 15% in 2014. So these results suggest that cardiac rehab may be an important opportunity to engage patients with mental health disorders in health behavior change that could improve their mental and physical health. Unfortunately, cardiac rehabilitation is vastly underutilized in the United States. Uh, this cartoon shows the marked drop off between uh, having eligibility for cardiac rehab at the time of an index event to uh, actually maintaining the health behavior change that is required to improve cardiac outcomes. Uh, only 80% of patients actually get referred for cardiac rehab. And then of those, 
half enroll, so only 40% of all the patients actually enroll in cardiac rehab programs. And then only half of those ever finish the cardiac rehab programs. So that brings us down to 20%. And then of the patients who actually finish cardiac rehab, only about one in three actually maintain their health behavior changes. So we clearly have a lot of work to do to uh, fill in these gaps and try to avoid this drop off. So uh, once again, we turn to Dr. Aides, who has uh, given us a roadmap to increase cardiac rehab, rehab participation. And this uh, Million Hearts Cardiac Rehab Collaborative paper outlines several key steps that uh, will help us improve our participation rates. And uh, some of these steps focus on the gaps and the fall off that occurred that occur in um, in usual care, and the first gap, of course, is in referral, and automatic referral has uh, shown great promise for embedding referral to cardiac rehab in the electronic health record, and making it um, easy for physicians to get patients. Uh, referred. Uh, once again, um, Dr. Aides showed that automated referral embedded in a discharge summary improved participation. Um, and now that we have electronic medical records, we are able to do this much more easily. And the Canadian Association of Cardiac Rehab uh, has endorsed systematizing inpatient referral to cardiac rehab. And so that has greatly improved uh, the referral process. Unfortunately, we still have a drop off between referral and enrollment. And for that, uh, evidence suggests that a bedside liaison can improve en enrollment after referral. After a heart attack stent a placement stent placement or bypass surgery, patients feel highly motivated to make lifestyle changes. And this is really a huge opportunity to improve health and longevity. So if we can catch them at that moment when they are feeling afraid and they are open to change, that is really a key point at which to engage them in cardiac rehab. Sherry Grace, uh, did a study where she compared patients who had a bedside liaison to kind of facilitate um, referral to cardiac rehab, the automatic referral that we already know works, and then a combination. And she found that the addition of a bedside liaison to the automatic referral substantially increased the proportion of patients who enrolled in cardiac rehab. So in this study, she uh, concluded automatic referral combined with patient discussion, uh, in other words, a bedside liaison can achieve among the highest rates of cardiac rehab referral and enrollment uh, reported. Wider adoption of sub such strategies could ensure that 45% more patients uh, get treated for cardiac disease and realize the benefits of cardiac rehab. Uh, before we move on, I'll uh, just stop to see if uh, there are any questions um, I see in the chat. Should all patients seeking help for depression be evaluated for cardiac problems? Uh, that, that's a great question. I think the answer is no. Um, Cardiac disease presents typically with symptoms. And so uh, routine screening of patients with depression for cardiovascular disease uh, would be extremely expensive and probably not, uh, well, certainly not a high enough yield to justify the cost 
of doing that. Thank you for the question, Anne. I'll go back to sharing my screen. The next gap, uh, or opportunity for improvement, of course, is getting patients to participate once they have enrolled. And uh, one of the great ways to engage patients and get more patients to participate is through home-based programs. And these have really uh, become more uh, mainstream in the past few years. Unfortunately, they're still quite poorly reimbursed so uh, it's been difficult to get uh, a rocket style takeoff, but we are making progress. Um, of course, once again, Dr. Aides thought about this 20 years ago uh, and the rest of us are just now catching up uh, with this controlled trial of uh, cardiac rehab in a home setting he actually used trans telephonic monitoring to uh, look at EKGs and found that uh, it was effective. And speeding forward to 2017, now we have a meta analysis and a Cochrane review showing that home based uh, and center based cardiac rehab provides similar benefits. 23 randomized trials found that they are equally effective for improving clinical and health-related quality of life. This uh, was just a chart from the meta-analysis, which showed uh, that the risk ratio for smoking mortality and completion was similar in patients who were enrolled in home-based versus center-based rehab. So essentially uh, no difference in the risk ratio for smoking. And actually a, a statistically significant increase of 4% in the proportion of patients who completed home-based versus center-based cardiac rehab. One uh, thing that I, noted from this uh, meta-analysis is that although not statistically significant, this point estimate suggests that home-based rehab may be associated with slightly higher mortality than center-based rehab. And while this is not statistically significant, I would uh, suggest that if a patient can enroll in center-based rehab, they absolutely should. Uh, because that's where we have the most evidence. But in most cases, the barriers to center-based rehab mean that patients won't enroll in anything. And in those cases, of course, home-based cardiac rehab is better than nothing. See, uh, in cardiac rehab programs, which do screen for depression, how frequently are patients who are depression positive given clinical treatment? Uh, that is a really great question. Uh, Dr. Middleton, I, I don't know uh, the answer. Um, in our own cardiac rehab program, we refer patients to a psychiatrist or psychologist for further evaluation if they screen positive, and uh, then they, you know, get treatment or uh, or counsel medication or treatment or counseling as indicated. Uh, at, at the VA, we, um, we did implement one of these home-based cardiac rehab programs, and uh, we were able to show that uh, the availability of home-based cardiac rehab programs resulted in a fourfold greater participation rate. Um, so in the VA, we have um, off-site facility-based cardiac rehab where the VA will pay for a patient to say, have their cardiac rehab at the University of Vermont. 
or another uh, university hospital or any cardiac rehab center. We also have on-site uh, cardiac rehab programs. So uh, many VA facilities provide cardiac rehab themselves. And then uh, we allow patients to uh, choose between off-site, on-site, or home-based cardiac rehab. And uh, there were only um, 12 centers by 2015 that had implemented the home-based cardiac rehab option. But we were able to show that between 2010 and 2015, as the number of VA facilities offering off-site, on-site, or home-based cardiac rehab increased, so did the participation in cardiac rehab go from 5% all the way up to 27%. Uh, and this was compared with those who uh, were referred to the offsite programs stayed around 6%. And those who had the choice between onsite facility or offsite facility based programs. And then uh, in 2019, a joint statement was uh, published um, in circulation and in the um, Journal of Cardiopulmonary Rehabilitation, uh, endorsing home-based cardiac rehab as an option. Of course, the mobile revolution and digital health has greatly improved uh, the tools that we have to deliver cardiac rehab. And so we can now monitor patients' physical activity using Fitbit step counts, and we can monitor their um, blood pressure using wireless blood pressure cuffs and wireless scales and wireless glucometers. So there have been many tools developed to assist us and uh, the effect of mobile applications has improved uh, adherence. Uh, this was a meta-analysis published in 2019 um, where they found that uh, we were still at the initial stages of implementing mobile applications, but uh, we were already starting to show positive benefits. Um, let's see. So there are many potential disadvantages of home-based cardiac rehabilitation, like the lack of reimbursement that I mentioned, uh, less intensive exercise training, perhaps, because uh, it's not always supervised. Uh, some patients really miss the social support. We have instituted uh, some online social support groups to try to uh, provide that service. Uh, patients may not feel as accountable if they're not being watched. And of course, lack of standardization across programs is even more challenging in the home-based environment. Uh, less face-to-face -face monitoring and communication uh, and safety concerns for some higher risk patients. Although there's really no evidence to suggest that home-based cardiac rehab is any less safe. Uh, but patients feel a little safer themselves if they are being supervised while they're exercising. In terms of the advantages, uh, home-based cardiac rehab gets integrated with the regular home routine. And so that's really beneficial because instead of patients feeling like, okay, I've done, I'm done with my cardiac rehab treatment, I've finished my center-based program, and now I'll go back to my regular old life with all my bad habits. This gets integrated with their regular home routine so that they're used to having exercise as part of their uh, days. Reduced enrollment delays, we were able to show that um, home-based cardiac rehab reduced the time to enrollment by 45 days, expanded capacity and access. Uh, you can individually tailor a home-based program uh, more so than a supervised facility-based program, and uh, the flexible convenient scheduling, of course. Uh, patients sometimes like the privacy, although many do miss the social support. 
and as the meta-analysis showed, potentially greater adherence and sustainability. Most importantly, however, home-based cardiac rehab is better than nothing. And uh, in the US, we're still at a very low participation rate, only about 20%. And so if we can double that with home-based cardiac rehab, we will have made a tremendous public health impact. Um, all right, so let's see. How's everyone doing out there? All righty, um, back to sharing my screen. Um, finally, uh, this is not some something that um, was mentioned in the roadmap, but something that I feel quite strongly about, which is that really um, we need to focus cardiac rehab on the things that patients can control which is their health behaviors. And, um, you know, cardiac rehab is somewhat complex. There, there are 10 key components of, you know, physical activity adherence, smoking cessation, eating, psychosocial support, and then blood pressure control, lipid management, diabetes, weight management, and of course, assessing patients at baseline and throughout their course of therapy. And this is just a little bit overwhelming to um, maybe for patients because really they, they can't do anything about their blood pressure or their lipids or their diabetes or their body weight. The only things that they can actually control are their health behaviors. So their activity the, the medications that they take, whether they smoke, and uh, what they eat. So I would like to suggest that our cardiac rehab evolution continue towards emphasizing those five key health behaviors and let the other aspects of cardiac rehab follow. Um, because these are really the only things that we can help patients control. Does a patient need equipment like a treadmill for home base? What about walking in place or walking up and down stairs? Great question. Uh, we actually do provide ex exercise bikes for the patients so they can have their own uh, spin bike at home. Um, treadmills usually... Uh, are, are too, too large for patients' homes, but bikes can fit. And walking in place, uh, we, we actually do have a um, one of those peddler machines. You can get them on Amazon for $25 where the patient can uh, set the resistance and do sitting uh, in place um, pedaling, or of course, uh, walking up and down stairs is a fantastic way to get exercise. Okay. Um, and this was a figure that we um, published in the scientific statement, just emphasizing the uh, modifiable health behaviors that patients can change. Um, Donna Bedian, many years ago emphasized that how important it is to separate out the structure uh, um, process and outcomes of a quality improvement intervention and uh, so that this figure puts the target behaviors at the center here um, but separates out what we do to change each of those behaviors and what are the outcomes that we measure to see the benefits of those changes. So 
we still care about blood pressure and glycemic control and lipid levels, but these are really outcomes rather than targets of our treatment. And uh, the American College of Cardiology has uh, come out with similar guidance on cardiac rehab to emphasize really the, the five key health behaviors, physical activity, smoking cessation, medication adherence, stress management, and healthy eating. In terms of tracking our progress, uh, these are the key metrics that um, I think will help us move forward. Uh, these were also recommended in the most recent um, guidelines that were published by Dr. Thomas et al. following the number of patients referred, the number of patients enrolled, the number of sessions completed, and the number of days from index event to enrollment. All right, I will... Um, See, just check the chat. Would you recommend that all patients in cardiology get a PHQ or GAD, even short versions? Okay, so um, this is a very controversial question about whether cardi cardiology patients should be screened for depression. Um, and in my opinion, um, that is not the job of cardiologists. Uh, the reason for that is that there really is no evidence that screening for depression alone affects cardiovascular outcomes. And because screening for depression needs to be accompanied by engagement in therapy and uh, case management to make sure that the patient gets the treatment that they need and close follow-up. So I think that depression screening should be done in primary care settings annually which, which it is. And uh, there is evidence that when combined with collaborative care model in which there's a case manager with a psychiatrist who uh, is in consultation and that they closely follow the patient and measure their outcomes and make sure that they actually get the medications that they need or enroll in the psychotherapy that's provided. Um, and then stepped care where those the intensity of those therapies are increased over time. That is great treatment, but um, just administering a PHQ or, or a generalized anxiety depression scale in a cardiology clinic, in my opinion, is, is worthless and, and possibly even harmful because if you discover depression and then do nothing about it, um, that is definitely not, not helpful. Um, who controls reimbursement and how can you influence those decisions? <laughs> that would be the million dollar question. Um, I guess CMS is really the great arbiter and most insurance companies follow CMS. So uh, there are the AACVPR, American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehab, which Phil has been engaged in for decades. Uh, it does a lot of uh, great lobbying to try to influence CMS. And uh, there is movement uh, in CMS whereby they are starting to at least measure uh, referral and enrollment in cardiac rehab and uh, reimburse for some telephone care. But uh, we have a long, long way to go. For example, well, there are many um, there are many issues that need to be addressed uh, in that political realm. Um, all right, so we are almost done. I just wanted to mention the silver lining of COVID on cardiac rehab delivery. Um, which is that it's really intensified a uh, push for home-based cardiac rehab options in a way that was not previously seen. I think there was some you know, skepticism about the benefits of, of home-based cardiac rehab and certainly uh, very, very poor reimbursement as Dr. Higgins points out, 
But now we've shown that cardiac rehab in the COVID pandemic has been able to continue uh, because of home-based cardiac rehab programs. And uh, several groups have now shown that cardiac rehab services have been able to continue. And as this uh, review in European Journal of Preventive Cardiology concluded, the future is now. It's a call for action for cardiac tele-rehabilitation in the COVID-19 pandemic from the European Association of Preventive Cardiology. So in conclusion, uh, the adverse cardiovascular outcomes associated with depression are largely explained by poor health behaviors. Uh, but cardiac rehab is an opportunity for us to improve both mental and physical health. Automatic referral using a bedside liaison and offering home-based cardiac rehab can improve participation. And focusing on the five modifiable health behaviors, in my view, simplifies the message. And as the European society concluded, really the future is now, let's use the COVID pandemic to demonstrate that the value of home-based cardiac rehab to, to these patients and hopefully improve reimbursement for it uh, by CMS and other insurers. All righty. Applause, applause. Well, thank you very much, Mary. And um, right now I'll say if anyone has questions, please type them in the Q&A and I will simply read them. I thought that was a terrific talk and I might start off with the first question, which is what do you see as the, the direction of your future research? Because I know that's a direction I should want to know a lot about. Thank you, Phil. Uh, well, as usual, I just look to your publications to see what the next hottest area is. But with that said, I think uh, in engaging patients and improving self-efficacy for these kinds of um, health behaviors is just a, an ongoing challenge. And that's why it's such a, you know, a privilege to speak with this group because you've been thinking about these things for decades. Um, I, I'm hoping that mobile technology may help us with some of that engagement if patients can actually, you know, see that we're watching their step count and that we care about their activity. And if they can perhaps be held a little more accountable uh, for their activity, that's a useful way for us to engage them. Medication adherence, they're also great electronic tools that can help with that. Uh, healthy eating, boy, a tough one. Um, I, I don't know how to, how to change that. And uh, smoking, I think has, there's been great progress made and uh, you guys have really um, been leaders in that area. Okay, if any other questions, please type in or just unmute and ask a question. Yeah, um, this is uh, Steve again, Higgins. <clears throat> I'm very interested in the reimbursement decisions um, related to some decisions in CMS regarding our field uh, with uh, one in particular is financial incentives to promote, well, it could be, we, as Diane Gleam and Phil have shown, a, a study with uh, cardiac rehab uh, adherence, but also uh, other types of interventions and at this point, they just um, declare that they're not participating in financial incentives. <laughs> and um, in one decision with regard to incentives and in, in, um, substance use disorders was in the office of the Inspector General in the Department of Health and Human Services um, out of concern that there could be fraud. Um, but but it's just, it has me thinking, and especially in your, your talk has me thinking even more, like who makes these decisions? I don't know who this, like who in the office of the inspector general, for example, is deciding, no, we're not, we're not funding that therapy and we're funding, like 
in your case, are there cardiologists involved in making those decisions, do you think? Uh, well, CMS has a committee um, that, you know, reviews all requests for reimbursement and makes those decisions. And it is a public process where anyone can um, submit uh, an idea. And then if, the CM if CMS is considering it, they'll have a public comment period. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I think our voices can get heard if we go through that process. Um, I I'm not aware of any way to get there through the Office of the Inspector General, uh, but the CMS does have a, a process in place by which we can, and, and by which we did actually get uh, cardiac rehab for heart failure approved. And but as far as the, you know, paying patients for health behaviors, um, you know, the, in California, they recently, one of our um, state uh, legislators is introducing a bill to pay patients not to take drugs. And you can imagine the controversy around that, but, you know, we're California, so <laughs> maybe it'll go through. <clears throat> well, that's, that's what, that's, exactly one of the interventions well I had in mind uh, because it's highly effective absolutely who are who are addicted but it would be equally effective in cardiac rehab um, as Diane has shown but um, but I was interested in the home home um, cardiac rehab I mean that seems perfectly reasonable and certainly you think there should be more reimbursement, but what's what's the snag on that? Well, uh, I don't have all the answers for sure, but I think one of the challenges is just how the, the potential for fraud, as you alluded to, because mm -hmm. patients are doing home cardiac rehab, it's really hard to, to know exactly what's happening and it's hard to uh, provide standardized ways for providers to take care of those patients. Mm -hmm. So um, the reimbursement for telephone care is exceedingly low. In fact, we get, the CMS provides a huge amount of payment for a video visit, but almost nothing for a telephone visit when it's exactly the same for us providers. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, maybe if we convert all of our home-based cardiac rehab to video visits and uh, we could time the video visits and then the reimbursement could be time-based might be an idea. No. Mm -hmm. One thing I would add is, um, I don't think we would have accomplished anything that we did like getting Medicare to cover heart failure uh, without the fact that our national organization has a legislative analyst also called the lobbyist who knows exactly how to get into the system. And it took probably 13 to 15 years as a process to get them to cover a cardiac rehab for heart failure. And they're now very involved in the process of trying to get coverage for home rehab. Uh, and I would just suggest, Steve, that mm -hmm. I know you belong to a number of organizations around the various interventions you do. And I would be very, uh, I think it's very likely that these organizations have legislative analysts. And I think going through them is the way to do it. And I know you will be heard as a prominent member of these various organizations. No, it's um, an Bill, there, I just wanted to mention that there's a couple questions in the Q&A. If you want to get great, to those. okay, let's go to those. Um, just real quick, that that what you just yeah, Steve. recommended and what Mary recommended is spot on target, and we do have an organization and we do have a lobbyist, but we have never used a lobbyist for this purpose. So you just really helped us out. Thank you. Okay, and the next question is from one of our cardiology fellows. Do you have any tips on how to identify motivating factors? for a cardiac patient to increase their physical activity and implement the changes they have been educated about? And I suspect this question relates to sort of like office-based care because in cardiac rehab, we have our approaches to do this. So if you're seeing a patient in the office, any tips on how to identify motivating factors? That, it, 
that's a great um, point. And there is a lot, a lot of evidence for motivational interviewing where you question the patient in such a way that they end up deciding what their own goals are and they end up deciding what their own um, changes are gonna be rather than us telling them what to do. So I think focusing on the things that motivate particular patients, you know, getting to their granddaughter's wedding or whatever um, is absolutely the key um, and proximal motivating things are also very key because it's hard for people to uh, weigh distant benefits when they're faced with immediate challenges. Great. Okay, I don't see further questions and we're at 102. I think what we'll do is stop there. That was just terrific, Mary, and I, I thank you for, from all of us. And I know some will be meeting with you just a little later. So again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. That was just great. Pleasure. Okay. Nice to meet you all. And thank you for your interest. And hopefully we have a new president by now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> all right. Take care. Thank you, Mary. Bye. Take care.